Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Anybody ever been in that kind of a condition? I don't mean you got and went out and committed murder, but I mean you just got in a bad place and suddenly sin didn't look like sin anymore and you did this and you did that and then you, come, you reach a point point, you look back and you say, oh my God. How could I have done what I did? How could I have thought the way I thought? But this is where David's at this point. He's blind. And so when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him after the time of mourning was over. David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. So you're, you're not talking about a week or two here, are you? You're talking about a spiritual condition that endured in David, obviously, for the, for the entire term of this baby, and now he's got a young son. I don't know how old, probably a toddler. But this is a year or two you're talking about here. When he's living in this state of spiritual blindness. I can tell this is the kind of a message where everybody just shouts and jumps and says amen. And, yeah, there's an amen at least. But thank God. But this is the truth, isn't it? And the thing is, there's not one of us here who can look down on David and say, well, look at you. Every one of us needs to be looking in the mirror and saying, hey, I need to wake up. I need to be alert. I need to be, you know, on my guard. Because I am not beyond the power of doing anything. If God's servant, a man after his own heart, can be can be led down, the, that led down this pathway and wind up committing murder. Folks, there is no depth to which a person cannot descend who starts down this path and doesn't stop and get honest. So she bore him a son, and up to this point, you know, it's just recounting what happened. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. You think? Oh my. So anyway, God's going to now step in. The Lord sent Nathan. Now Nathan is a prophet. The Lord sent Nathan to David when he came to him. And he came to him, uh, you know, using a story that would appeal to David's sense of righteousness. He knew if he just come right out and said, David, you know, but he came and he, he absolutely told him a story about something that, hap that supposedly happened. It says, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very great number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, it grew up with him and his children, it shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. I mean, talk about painting a picture. This rich guy and the poor man's got this one little lamb that's so close to him, it's like a daughter. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who would come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, prepared it for the one who'd come to him. Whoa. All of a sudden, David's moral sense got totally, you know, struck. He was outraged. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who does this, did this deserves to die. He must, I mean, he wants this guy to die for taking, stealing a lamb. And this is, guess what's about to land on him? Ooh. How easy it is, is it for us to look at somebody else and have this sometimes self-righteous indignation rise up and point the finger and condemn and not see us? Why do you think Jesus said, talked about judging and said, you know, don't judge. Get, first get the beam out of your eye, your eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye you got a log in yours, and you're trying to help him get the speck out of his. God, help us. We need to look at ourselves first. And I'll tell you, if we do, then we're going to find out what we are, 
then we're going to be able to help somebody else with a different spirit. You know, there is a place for going to one another. Paul talked about it when he said if, if somebody's overtaken in a fault, in other words, sin has really gotten a hold there, there's a real problem going on. It isn't just some little act. It's, it's, you can see somebody beginning to get in jail, spiritually speaking. What does he say? You, go, you who are spiritual go to such a one, but how? In a spirit of meekness. Why? Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. There's always got to be that sense that, hey, I'm not above this. I'm, I'm made of the same stuff that they are. I cannot look down on anyone. I'm here to help, but I'm not here to condemn and point a finger. All right, so David is really angry. As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. All right, at this point, David still does not have a clue. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Now think of the courage that took for Nathan. Kings in that day had the power of life and death. All David would have had to say, you, how dare you speak to me that way? Off with his head. It wouldn't be like Alice in Wonderland off with the head. This, was this would have really happened. And it did happen. There were other cases where prophets of God were sent to men to, to tell them the truth, and they lost their lives over it. Or they were thrown in prison. They were persecuted. But Nathan went to this man and obeyed God. God give us that kind of courage. We need courage to speak the truth because the truth absolutely will cut across this, what we need to be delivered from. But David truly was a man after God's own heart who had just gotten in a very, very bad place because he had just become careless and self-confident. But all of a sudden, the prophet comes to him, you were the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. God's not stingy, is he? This was a God who longed to bless his servant. And he says this, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You know, when we go down these kind of roads, think about what we're doing. Isn't that what we're doing? When God has given clear instruction to his children as to what he desires out of us, not only has he given instruction, he's given his spirit so that it makes it possible. And for us to sort of get cooled off by the world that we live in and begin to suddenly sin is not so sinful and we can, we can make excuses, we can drift, we can sort of toy with sin and go down the wrong road. What we're really doing is despising what he says. God, you're not telling me the truth. It's not like you say it is. Oh, God, give us hearts that are humbled before him and honest. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. The Lord charged him with that. And yeah, he, he arranged it all to happen. As far as God is concerned, David picked up a sword and killed him himself. You killed him with the sword, or you, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did this in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Whoa. Talk about straight shooting message there. There's no compromise in that. But I see something in David here that you don't see in Saul and a whole lot of others. David didn't make any excuse. He had nothing to say except, 
I have sinned against the Lord. He doesn't say Bathsheba shouldn't have been doing that. He didn't say any other thing. He didn't say, Lord, look at all the good things I've done. Yes, I made a mistake. He didn't, there was no justification. It was absolute. You read Psalm 51. And you will see the kind of, the spirit of repentance that he had. It was, God, you are 100% right. I am 100% wrong. I make no excuse for, for what I did. I'm just going to, I'm going to lay myself before your feet and just appeal to you for mercy. So he knew he had no other ground upon which to approach God. And what did Saul say, you know, when, the, when Samuel came to him? He said, yes, I did obey the Lord. I destroyed them and I brought these to make, to make an offering. So that isn't what the Lord told you. You know, how we respond when God puts the finger on the thing that's wrong in our lives says a lot about us. Most of us are very, very good at saying, well, it's not quite as bad as you think. You got to consider this. You got to consider that. Well, I, my motive was good. You know, thousand and one little things that we will have to try to make something better in our own eyes, instead of just saying, your truth, Lord, I did it, and I'm sorry. But you know, God is looking for honest hearts. Even though this was a distressing, saddening thing for the Lord, I don't see God coming to him with thunders, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to blast you into oblivion over this thing. There was a, there was a God who came with a forgiveness, but yet you know, you notice something here. There were consequences to this sin. You know, David was forgiven, wasn't he? I believe God answered the prayer of Psalm 51, where he said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then I'm going to be able to teach sinners your ways. God was a forgiving God. You read the Psalms and you will see that message over and over again. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. God had, David had a respect for God. God forgave him his sin. But I tell you, there are things that we do that set things in motion. There are consequences when we go down these roads. David's life took a turn right here. And because of what he had done, he still had a lot of a natural reaping to do. Things that he would never have had to endure. He had his own son rise up in rebellion against him and push him off the throne. He had to run for his life, flee from his son. And he had wars that he never would have had. And of course, he, you, you read in this, uh, this chapter 12, you go on and, you talk, and, and the Lord had said, the child is going to die. You did this. I lifted you up. Is what, that's the problem here. God lifted David up before all the nations of the world. This is my servant. He is a servant of the Most High God. I have honored him. And how, now here's David doing this and giving occasion to everybody out there to say, uh-huh, yeah, look, you're just like me. David says, because you've done that, the child is going to die. And the child got sick, and David just prostrated himself. He, he fasted for like the seven-day period, I guess, it took the child to die, and he just he refused to eat, and he lay there, and he cried out to God for mercy. And his, his condition was such that the servants were afraid to tell him when the child died. They said, look, he's been prostrate. If we tell him, he's going to go nuts. He's going to go crazy. He's going to go over the edge if we tell him the child has actually died now. So they find, he sees the servants whispering over there and says, is the child dead? And they say, yes. And they're waiting for, <laughs> waiting for the axe to fall or waiting for something to happen. And to their amazement, he gets up takes a bath, gets clean, and orders some food, orders supper. And they're looking at him, why in the world? I don't get this. I don't understand it. He said, while the child was alive, I poured out my heart to God. I said, well, just maybe the God will be merciful in this case. He says, but now that he's gone, it's over. I, 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 you know, he won't come to me. I'll go to him one day. We'll be in the same place one day, but there's no point in... in doing what I've been doing anymore. And of course, it go, the story goes on. Actually, this Bathsheba became the mother of Solomon. So God can certainly weave the tattered threads of our lives into something that's eternal. I thank God we got a God like that. 
but I don't want to go down these kind of roads, do you? We, I tell you, it's so easy, as I say, in the world that we live in, not to fully appreciate the power of sin. We drink it up through so many sources. I mean, we, you know, you camp in front of the television set, and I, you know, I watch it some too, but I try to, you know, try to guard my spirit against what, I, what little I do watch. But I'll tell you what, if you just sort of drink it in, it will absolutely dull you right down. It will blunt your spiritual edge, and all of a sudden you'll just be in and something will come into your mind and you will entertain things you would not have entertained if you'd been living in God's presence and seeking Him and staying close to Him. And I tell you, that's what we need in this hour. God is building an army and He's looking for people who will serve Him and, and stand for Him and, and learn how to fight the good fight of the faith. You know, what did, what did Peter say when he warned the people? He said, beware. Or, well, I better look at it. First Peter 4, you know the scripture. Chapter 5, I'm sorry. He said, be, be self-controlled and alert. Verse 8, be self-controlled. What happened? David allowed something else to get control. There was an impulse that arose from him that simply demanded attention. In this case, it was his physical lust. Just be straight about it. It rose up and said, pay attention to me. Feed me. Feed me. And instead of saying, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is going down the wrong road. He thought about it. And he began to entertain that. He began to yield. And began to, you know, little by little, by little he gave into this thing. And look where it led him. Be self-controlled. God has not given us, Paul said, the spirit of fear but of power and love, and the NIV says self-control. God has given us the power to be able to rule over this, these bodies of ours. He also wrote to Timothy, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That may not be the exact quote, but it's, it's essentially what, what he said. It's God's will. You know, I appreciate what Chip read recently about God's will being that we are thankful for everything. That's exactly right. Well, this is another statement of God's will. God, it's God's will that we absolutely learn how to take possession of our own bodies, our own vessels, and use them for God instead of allowing sin to control them. That's what it's about. But he said, but see, we're not alone in this deal. This is not just us in the ether. This is, we've got an enemy. Be self-controlled and alert. Why? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. What's he doing? Looking for someone to devour. Now, you know, you, ever, you watch lions hunt and some of these nature shows. and What do they tend to do? They're going after a, a flock of, not a flock, but a, you know, a herd, I guess, of gazelles or something some type of animal that they, they consider prey, what do they look for? They look for stragglers, weak ones that kind of get out on the periphery and wander. The devil got you on the periphery. You're kind of off by yourself. You're in a vulnerable place. Oh, I'll tell you, we need to be close. We need to recognize the spirit of the age and what the Lord is calling us to do. Be self-controlled and alert. He's looking for someone to devour. This was not written to unbelievers. This is written to believers. Look at David, one of the greatest men of God in the Bible. And yet look what he was capable of under the right circumstances. Boy, that's a, that's a sobering message to us, isn't it? But thank God we can do what he says in verse 9. Resist him. Why? Standing firm in the faith. We realize that we're not standing against him in our own strength. There is a strength that God has given us that's enough to do the job, but we are going to have to make choices that stand in that faith. Faith is not in ourselves. It's standing firm in the faith. Faith is, where is faith directed to? It's directed to the Lord. How many songs were sung this morning about him being our strength? Well, this is, this is the, one of the greatest needs that we have is for strength, moral courage, 
God help us. Standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. You're not alone. You know, you, that one you're looking down the, down the row at and thinking they're doing great, they might be like David, putting on a front. See, I can't see any, into anybody's heart this morning. I have no idea why the Lord put this on my mind. But there's a, if it's only for a warning, that's enough. But I'll tell you, there may be somebody here who's in real danger. And God loves you enough to look you in the eye and say, watch out, wake up. Yes. Satan is going to make going to make a mess out of your life if you keep going the way you're going. You need him. And the God of all grace, that's it. Not the God of all condemnation, the God of grace. The God who will extend his own spirit to strengthen us and help us to be what he wants us to be. He called you to his eternal glory in Christ. After you suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong. Firm and steadfast, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Folks, may God give us grace today to not let a spirit of complacency take hold in our lives. I thank God for times of blessing. I thank God for times when, man, we enjoy the Lord's presence. It's just wonderful. We get together like you know, the weekend down in Columbia and I understand the service here you had, Lord blessed, praise God, that's wonderful. But what happened Wednesday night? Pretty good case in point. We got complacent, and the Lord just let us sit here a while. How easy it is to experience some of the Lord's blessings and, and turn it into a curse because we're careless. But God wants us to stay close. He is everything that we need. His hand reaches out in love, and when we need it, he, doesn't, he knows how to, how to put his finger in our face without condemnation and convict us and help us and draw us closer. Let's seek him and serve him and, and be watchful and stay close. Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.